Hello, everyone. Um, today we are going to host uh, Dr. Lawrence. And uh, Dr. Lawrence holds a PhD in computer science from University of Bath, uh, where his research focuses on unsupervised learning and uh, with a uh, basing non parametric and uh, was published at uh, ICML and NURIPS. And, uh, and Dr. Uh, Lawrence previously worked at a satellite communication company in San Diego, where he was involved in the proposals, design, and acceptance of UHF control station for NATO and UK MOD and the uh, Australian uh, Defense Force at Causal Lens, based in London. And uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence uh, and his colleagues uh, are developing uh, Causal AI, a new category of intelligence technology that can reason about the world uh, the way human do uh, through cause and effect relations and uh, with uh, imagination. Um, his respons responsibilities uh, include publications, software development, patents, and grants. Uh, he also leads the, the hiring process for the research team. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, we are going to listen to your talk. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak to everyone today. I'm really excited for it. Um, as mentioned, yeah, I did my PhD at the University of Bath, and then I went to work as a research scientist at Causal Lens. I've been at Causal Lens now since uh, November of 2019, so I moved from Bath to London just to sit in my apartment in London for about two years, but uh, really like it. Uh, we're growing quite quickly, uh, so as mentioned, yeah, I manage the hiring for the research team, but we're hiring across the board, so if people are interested, we have data science roles, we have uh, engineering roles, uh, mainly like software development. So please reach out. My email is on the title card if you are interested. So yeah, the talk is on essentially like what is causal AI. So it's kind of a bit of a high level discussion, kind of going to go through some methods, kind of like motivate people to maybe try to learn more. Um, still a bit of a niche subject. So would, yeah, like to get more people working on it. Let's see, can I move? There we go. Cool. Um, so yeah, what's brief outline of the talk, mainly let's motivate the problem, why is causality important, and then kind of outline the pipeline of like how we think decisions should be made using these like ML techniques. We kind of feel like the current pipeline from data to recommendations is a little bit broken and kind of suggest a better way. And then a bit of a conclusion showing like where the space is going and stuff. And I guess like you always hear Correlation is not causation. I thought this image was quite representative of that. So like clearly the seagull did not cause the, the pipe to bend on that fence. So to start, we wanna look at um, what like a, a book by uh, psychologist Daniel Kahneman has said. He uh, is notable for his work in psychology on judgment and decision-making. He specifically divided cognition into two systems. There's a system one, which is fast, automatic, instinctive, and intuitive. And system two is slower, analytical, deliberate, and is around like planning and reasoning. And um, this paper by Sholkoff and his uh, collaborators, they kind of argue that current deep learning, um, don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, going there, current deep learning and ML approaches are kind of really this like system one, you kind of take like a fire hose approach to throw in a lot of data and like, let's get some predictions where we kind of need to move to like version 2.0, where we take more of a methodical approach and give some recommendations that people can actually use in the real world. So like this system essentially is kind of needed for decision making. Um, Causal Lens is like very interested in the finance world. A lot of our customers are kind of finance based. Um, and we're very interested in like time series. So if you would like consider how maybe Warren Buffett does his investment decisions like you have a highly non-stationary world right like you're the um like macroeconomic environment and like all this like market data from last year doesn't necessarily hold in this year so it's much more of a deliberate path towards making these investment decisions you do hypothesis you take some small logical steps you have some assumptions about the economy um and that's really like what he's doing and his team behind like reasoning and building up his portfolio. Uh, so like one of the most fundamental questions we wanna essentially answer is if I choose to perform an action, 
what will be its effect? And that's kind of a lot of what we talk about here is how to estimate um, what's often known as like a treatment effect or a causal effect in the causality space. And to teach machines how to reason, we must teach them causality. So as I mentioned, yeah, how do we, uh, how do we essentially estimate this treatment effect? We have some tentative of cause X, which you could think of in the ML space as some feature and a tentative of effect Y. So this is normally your target variable in a supervised learning sense. How would I go about calculating what the effect of doing X on Y is? Well, in like the uh, best case scenario, you would run what's called a randomized control trial. And this is often done in the medical space because um, you're working with like human patients, right? And you really need to ensure that there's no ill side effects and that your drug is actually having effect on the specific need. So yeah, you would directly intervene on X and measure the change in Y. But like, that's not always possible. Uh, it may be unethical, it may be very expensive. Um, so then let's also think about like the economic case, right? Uh, we cannot like call up the Bank of England and tell them to adjust the interest rate, right? We have to just use observational data and that's kind of the other way. Um, so an observational study, you collect data on X and Y that naturally occur, and you try to make inference based on that. Uh, and that's exactly what these next economists did, and they won a Nobel Prize for it in 2021. So their work was around estimating the effect of different government policies um, on like the citizens, right? And they used this technique from causality called instrumental variables. I'll touch on it a bit later but they won a Nobel Prize this year, essentially for estimating what the, these government policies, the effects of these policies would be on their citizens. Uh, and if anyone's interested, there's a weekly causality seminar, this online causal inference seminar, where um, Guido was interviewed actually at the beginning of this month. So if people are interested to learn more, uh, please check that out. And yeah, it's not just like the Nobel uh, group that are, acknowledging this new work, like there's Turing Award winners that are kind of out there preaching the gospel. Um, sure, people have heard of like Judea Pearl and Yoshio Benjio, um, but Gary Marcus is a psychologist who's working on human reasoning in ML, and they're all out here essentially pushing, pushing for causality. So um, I think it's gonna become more popular in the near future. So let's look at maybe a quantitative example. So I kind of gave like, a bit of the motive, um, momentum behind causality, but let's kind of see where it's important and why. So this is actual data from Israel. Um, and if you just look at the raw data, it seems to apply that vaccines are only 67.5% efficient against um, the Delta variant. Uh, apologies, these slides were a bit more topical when first put together <laughs> before Omicron came, but I think the, uh, the point still kind of stands, right? So this seems a bit weird, right? So just looking at the raw numbers, the efficacy is only 67.5%. But as soon as we break it down with age, so um, what's on the right now I've added is what's called like a causal graph or a directed acyclic graph. Um, I haven't told you how I made it yet, but we'll kind of get into some techniques to essentially discover this graph. And this graph is trying to represent what's like the true data generating process of your problem. So the colors here are kind of like positive and negative effects. Um, so obviously when the pandemic was first starting, right? Like they prioritized older people for the chance of getting a vaccine, right? So the older you are, the more likely you are to be eligible to get a vaccine. But conversely, the older you are, the more likely you are to have a severe case of COVID-19. Uh, and then the hypothesis here really is that getting a vaccine will negatively impact the chance of getting a severe case. So that's kind of double negative, but it should, uh, yeah, you should be right, less likely to be severely impacted by COVID if you have a vaccine. So as soon as we introduce age into this equation, um, age is what we would call a confounder in this scenario, and I'll define that in a few slides. And as soon as we break it down now, let's do some threshold of 50 for old versus young. And you can see 
when you look at specific groups, the efficacy is much higher against the Delta variant. Um, and then calculating it on a whole, it's clear that the vaccines have an 89.6% of efficacy. So this is like a much different result, right? Like if you just blindly look at all of the data, you're gonna come to the wrong conclusion. And that's what's known as uh, Simpson's paradox. It's essentially like a trend that appears in several groups of data, but disappears or even reverses when um, the groups are combined. So when all ages are combined, the trend is much uh, smaller than when you look at the individual groups. Um, and that's kind of where like this difference between correlation and causation comes in. When we calculated the initial 67.5, we essentially just were calculating the expectation of this conditional distribution. So you have the expectation of this likelihood that you're sick given the vaccine. And that's just how many vaccinated people got sick. And that's purely just uh, like correlation. So what was the observed conditional likelihood? But the real question we wanna answer is what we'd say is a causal question. What is the effect of taking the vaccine? So it's not just this observational, it's trying to estimate if you give someone the vaccine, what's the efficacy, right? And this is a subtlety, but it is an important question. And how we would actually do that is like this mathematical notation isn't really there in classical statistics. We would use what Pearl introduced called do calculus. Um, I'll discuss this a bit later, but essentially you're saying I'm doing an intervention, meaning I am forcing this person to have a vaccine, right? This is another unethical scenario. You cannot just like force a random person to have a vaccine, right? So you wanna perform inference using the observational data that you collected from the whole country of Israel. So what happens if you intervene, uh, giving someone a vaccine on the likelihood that they're sick? And what you actually have to do is marginalize out your confounder. So in this case, age is a confounder. Um, again, how we discovered that I'll get to in a bit. But this likelihood of P of sick given vax isn't really the true thing. The likelihood of sick has to condition on both vax and age. And then you have your prior for age and you're marginalizing over age. And that's how you get the true effect of taking the vaccine. Um, and here's another like classical example of the Simpsons paradox. It's maybe a bit easier to see. When you look at all groups of people here, you get this weird conclusion that the more you exercise, the higher your cholesterol is. So imagine just blindly looking at this data and being like, you have high cholesterol, stop exercising, right? Like that's the complete opposite decision of what you would want to tell a patient. Um, and then when you actually break it down by specific age groups, again, age is a confounder here, you see a flip in the uh, direction of the relationship. The more someone exercises, the lower their cholesterol is. So I kind of mentioned before that we're adjusting for or marginalizing out this confounder. And there's kind of many ways that we can do this. Uh, you can look at the conditional probabilities. You can uh, adjust for them using linear regression. That's kind of assuming your entire system is linear. Uh, there's many more ways. I'll, I'll get to this actually a bit further as well. But you have to know what to adjust for. So here with age, I kind of just gave us the answer, right? But if you adjust for the wrong variable, you can make the result even worse than looking at just the pure conditional. So I mentioned that age in this case is a confounder, right? So here's like a generic causal graph. In the vaccine example, uh, the confounder was age, the treatment was the vax, and the effect was uh, how severe your case of COVID was. And essentially a confounder can just be defined as any variable that leads to this inequality, where the conditional of Y given X doesn't equal the interventional distribution. Um, so you would say that like spurious correlations also are uh, not causal drivers. So in this effect, we have a edge going from your treatment to your effect, but you could also have some confounder that what this is essentially saying is the data generating processes, you'd sample some C, and then from that you could, uh, there's some functional dependency to X and some functional dependency to E. Obviously they would be highly correlated because they have a shared common cause, but there's no direct connection between them. So like if you built a model 
using X to predict E it is clearly not as good as using what is uh, the true causal driver. Um, so yeah, the spurious correlations is kind of another problem that, that pops up a lot. Um, and just to tie it to like traditional ML, this P of X given Y is essentially what you're modeling when you perform like empirical risk minimization in a supervised learning case. X could be like your uh, feature matrix and Y is your target. And normally what you're estimating is um, the conditional mean estimator. So you would be trying to figure out this expectation of the conditional, which you don't really want. Because if you see what we did before, you would be predicting that uh, in the previous case, you would be predicting that given exercise, someone's cholesterol is going to be high, which would be a horrible prediction, right? Um, so essentially, there is no Simpsons paradox, right? Like it's uh, something that people see in observational all the time. But if we know how to use the correct approaches from causality, we're able to uh, estimate the true causal effect. Um, and yeah, I'll kind of show how we how we know how to do the adjustment and how to learn the graph in a second. I just also want to highlight these like dangers of spurious correlations. This isn't really like a purely academic exercise, right? Like this is stuff that happens in the real world. So here's an image classifier that essentially picks up on the spurious correlation of grass and cow, right? The training set is just loaded with images of cows in fields. And all you've essentially learned is a grass detector, right? It, it knows there's a pasture in some animal, so it's gonna guess with high likelihood that it's a cow. But as soon as you provide it some scenario where that spurious correlation is broken, in this case a beach, it, it doesn't make the correct prediction at all. Um, what's on the right isn't necessarily like an ML model, but like you see people making these arguments online. What one of them is, is, uh, 5G network connectivity in the US and the other is COVID cases, right? And like <laughs> people are saying, oh, 5G causes COVID, but really what it's confounded with is population. You're gonna have higher COVID cases where there's dense population and you're gonna have more 5G coverage where there's dense population. I don't even know which map is map, which because they're so like correlated, right? And then this is a fun website that I took one graph from. Um, if people are interested, they just find like these crazy correlations in time series that have no effect at all. But this has a essentially like a 0.99 Pearson correlation and it's divorce rate in main versus per capita consumption of margarine, right? If you're building some ML model, you would never want to use one of these as a feature to predict the other. It, it makes no sense, but if you're just throwing like a bunch of correlated features into some deep neural network, it's gonna try to find some connection and you, you really don't wanna do that. Oops, so um, now I kinda wanna get into the, like, what's the pipeline for learning these causal models? Um, I'm taking a look at the chat cause that might've been a good spot to pause briefly for questions, but I don't see any. Um, so I'll continue, but if anyone does have any questions, please add it to the chat and I, I can stop at like the next uh, good section break. So let's look at maybe the traditional pipeline for learning some ML model, right? You're gonna collect data and the best like state of the art models right now are these deep neural networks uh, for vision cases and time series they are using transformers also for NLP. Um, and you'll build essentially this black box ML model. Uh, it's really hard to, have any interpretability into what's going on inside of it because it's got a huge parameter space and you don't know what function it really learned, but you provide it with so much data that it ends up, you know, working very well in these like image classification scenarios. But as soon as you go outside of that distribution, it fails as we saw with the cow example. Um, there's a lot of techniques now for this post hoc explanation. So think of like SHAP and Lime, where you're trying to interpret the model after the fact. And then you use these post hoc explanations to make decisions. So why is this wrong? So the spurious correlations I've pointed out, uh, which could be coming from hidden confounders, lack of explainability. You're often overfitting with these deep neural network models. Um, as soon as you get out a sample, the performance is really poor. Um, there's lack of trust, right? Uh, we've found with a lot of 
our customers, some of them still just trust general like OLS uh, or fairly simple decision tree models because they understand what's going on underneath it. If you don't trust the model, you're not going to use it in production. Um, and you have, if it's a black box, you're not really sure if there's some inherent bias. Are we using gender to make some decision about salary or about a loan application, right? If you can't answer that question, you can't really deploy that in the real world. So what we kind of recommend and like everyone in the causality space is kind of going towards this modeling uh, paradigm is you now collect data, you try to learn this causal DAG. Uh, from that, you can already actually make some decisions. So you saw how I could adjust for the efficacy of the vaccine. So you can kind of do that directly. You, it's a bit more explainable already. Uh, for more power, you can build a structural causal model that allows us to estimate interventions and counterfactuals, uh, and then you can make decisions. So by finding this causal graph, ideally we're you know, removing any spurious correlations. We understand what the compounders are. Uh, it's ex ante explainable, meaning it's like inherently explainable. You don't have to do these post hoc techniques. Generalizes well to new environments. Um, what we're really trying to model with the structural causal model is the true data generating um, process, right? So if we have represented the data generating process, we should generalize to unseen data fairly well, as long as that distribution is still stationary, right? Um, and then yeah, more trustworthy and fair. So let's kind of step through um, each of these uh, four steps and see how to do it. So how do we create this causal DAG, right? This is a really hard problem. I said before, ideally you could, you know, intervene and run some randomized controlled trial. But in a lot of the scenarios we're looking at, this just is not feasible, it's not ethical, um, or it, it's too expensive. Uh, classical like space where you could do it is kind of in marketing or um, you know, like UI design, a lot of places do this A-B testing, uh, but that's still quite expensive, right? And if you want to test many different interventions, you have to do lots of different testing. So if there's a way to estimate like, what the effect of a certain marketing campaign would be without having to run it, you're going to save a company a lot of money. Uh, and what we're going to talk on, touch on here really is how to perform causal discovery upon observational data, because that's the case that we're with a lot. Uh, and additionally, you could apply some domain knowledge. Uh, for example, the domain knowledge um, that we had before is like, if you're looking at age, right? age is going to kind of be at the top of this topological sort of the graph because you know nothing can impact age. Uh, in a loan example, you might be looking at someone's age and income. Normally, age has an effect on income. The older you get, the more you earn. But if you suddenly double your income, you're not going to double your age, right? Like it, that effect can't go that direction. That would be an anti-causal direction. So some human context would be, I know age has to be at the top of this graph because nothing can affect it. Um, so let's look at like the very simple case of just two variables, X and Y. Um, and really like what a predictive model is trying to do is just learn this joint distribution. So the likelihood of X comma Y. But a causal model will contain more information than just the observational distribution that you have. It, we'll learn what's called these interventional distributions. So what would be the effect on Y if you intervene on X? And what would be the effect of X if you intervene on Y? Um, so in the two variable scenario, there, you, you measure them, they have some statistical association. In the most simple case, think of like Pearson correlation, right? Which is some linear correlation metric. Uh, and there's essentially four possibilities right? X causes Y, Y causes X. There's some unobserved compounder Z that's causing both X and Y. And because we're always in this finite sample world, the, st the statistical association could be spurious, right? If you have small number of samples, you might think there's some association, but as you observe more data, you actually see that they're, they're really independent. Uh, and this was what's called Rieschenbach's common cause principle. Um, and what I was saying here with like X causes Y, Y causes X, you could look at the following DAGs, right? Um, 
And this essentially tells one how to factorize the joint distribution. So if X causes Y, the joint is the likelihood of Y given X, P of X, um, and so on. This would be the latent confounder. You, ideally, like, right, you haven't observed this, but if you modeled the joint here, X and Y become independent once you condition on Z. So X is independent of Y conditioned on Z. And then the case where it's just due to small sample, X and Y are actually independent. So the joint just factorizes. Um, if like you cannot um, reduce the joint to like a single choice from here, because you might not be able to measure uh, again, due to finite sample, due to imperfect oracles, which I'll get to in a second, the conditional independencies that you can actually measure in the data might not be enough to converge on a single DAG. And the P of X, Y here, this joint is like the observation that you've measured. If you can't converge to a single one, you actually converge to what's called a Markov equivalence class of graphs. So there's multiple graphs that are, are as equally likely to represent the data that you've observed. Um, I'll show that a bit with an uh, example of a common causal discovery algorithm in a second. So this Rieschenbach's common cause hasn't stopped people from actually trying to infer the direction. Again, just looking at pairs in this case. And what people do is look at the uh, asymmetry between the spread in both directions. Um, and here's like a common example, right? So a human would understand this quite inherently. So this is another example of human context. So this is temperature versus altitude. Looking at the scatter plot, you wouldn't really be able to say which causes which, but we would know, okay, if you like increase the temperature, that doesn't magically drop your altitude, right? So you would have some sense there. Um, and the case of this asymmetry I'm talking about here, it's only true in certain scenarios. So if you have a linear system with additive Gaussian noise, you cannot resolve which direction that arrow is pointing, if it's x to y or y to x. So in this case, you look at building a model of y given x, and here you look at a model of x given y, and you make the assumption that you have an additive noise model and that the noise is independent of your covariate, right? So in this case, you want your noise to be independent of X and here the noise to be independent of Y. So if you plot the residuals of your model in both scenarios, this is highly uncorrelated, right? And it looks like they're independent in both directions. So you cannot resolve if X goes to Y or Y goes to X. Um, and I give example for like other additive noise. Um, the super Gaussian is actually the Laplace distribution. Um, bit of a difference in the paper that I reference here, but Essentially here, you can see uh, independence between them, but if you go the other direction now, uh, there is some dependency between your feature and your uh, noise. So this asymmetry actually helps determine which direction the arrow should go. Um, but we're using a bit of like human context there already, right? So in the previous slide, I was talking about additive noise model and making some decision about the functional form of your model. It was linear in that case and about the distribution on your noise. But this human context is really true anywhere in traditional ML, right? You're always making some assumption about your noise distribution. Uh, you're always making some choice about the functional form that it would take. You choose linear regression if you assume your system's linear, right? But you're gonna do some nonlinear approach if not. Um, so the space of causal discovery kind of makes all of these assumptions and you want to apply methods that make the most sense for the system that you have. Um, some of the common assumptions are that the relationship between the variables or a specific class of function or are invertible in the case of before it was linear, uh, different additive noise models, um, Gaussian, non-Gaussian. This Lin-GAM specifically assumes that you have non-Gaussian additive noise. It's also assuming linearity. Uh, a lot of methods assume that there's no hidden confounders, right? Which is something you can't assume in the real world. You're never gonna be able to measure all of the variables that interact on your system. Uh, this is called causal sufficiency. Uh, that 
the relationships don't cancel. This is a faithfulness assumption, meaning that the conditional dependencies you can actually measure in the data um, match the true causal graph. Uh, and yeah, there's there's many more. So there's two broad classes of causal discovery. Uh, there's a score based, which normally works. Uh, you could do like a greedy search approach. There's exhaustive search. There's also uh, gradient based methods. And they're typically scores that are like some relationship of the predictive quality of the model. So that Lingam I mentioned before is assuming you learn a linear model at the same time as learning the graph. Um, some parsimony, meaning you want sparse graphs, you don't want it to be very dense, and you always have some aclicity constraint because you can't have loops essentially. Um, and then there's uh, methods that rely on the directly trying to uh, detect the conditional independent relationships between the variables, and these are called constraint based. Uh, so the next slide, I'm specifically going to look at uh, one of the most well known constraint based methods. This is the PC algorithm. Uh, and essentially what you want to measure is like, what's the conditioning set to separate your variables. So like if I condition on Z, the joint for X and Y factorizes, right? So X and Y become independent. So how the PC algorithm works, um, this is a four variable system. This is the true causal graph. You start with a fully connected um, undirected graph. So you can imagine like the edges grow quite quickly with a number of nodes. Uh, and what you want to do is slowly perform these conditional independence tests with increasing separation set size. So you initially say, are X and Y independent conditioning on, empty, on the empty set, X and Z on the empty set, and you go through all of these. So the very first step, X and Y are independent conditioning on nothing. So you're able to delete that edge. Then you go, okay, let's look at all sets of size one, looking at the neighbors that exist here. So X and W, this line here, are independent if you condition on Z. So that's what you see here. Conditioning on Z, you can break this edge and same is true for Y and W. Um, and then you keep going for larger sets, but we can't delete any more edges. Uh, and then there's a whole set of these orientation rules. So you look for these V structures and you're able to orient the edges. So because X and Y, you're able to delete the edge conditioning on nothing, we know that Z is a collider in this case. Uh, and then there's another rule for orientation propagation where we can say uh, W is a descendant of Z. Uh, so this is like a very simple example, but kind of shows like how these methods don't scale very well, right? So if you could, the problem is going to grow exponentially with the number of nodes. Um, so it also assumes that you have what's known a perfect oracle. So I'm doing this conditional independence test. And we're assuming it's perfect, right? Which is never the case. As soon as you have small sample sizes, you might not be able to say something's independent, even though it, it actually is. Uh, and we're able to converge on a single graph here. But as I mentioned before, the best you can actually theoretically do is discover what's called these Markov equivalent class of graphs. So they have the same likelihood of being correct given the conditional dependencies and independencies that you can measure in the data. And that happens even with a perfect oracle. So a lot of these constraint-based methods, you're not going to converge on a single graph, um, even if you have a perfect test, right? Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, trying to find this conditioning set for Z grows exponentially in the number of variables. And this problem is actually an NP hard problem. Um, and let me see. So yeah, so like people are trying to also do it for cancer bio, biomarkers. We have like a preprint on this, but a lot of people are working on it. So like imagine if you have 20,000 nodes, right? This is going to be a huge problem and something you cannot just apply blindly. Um, so yeah, so kind of just a summary. I Most of the time we can never perform these experiments to to recover this true causal DAG. So we're gonna perform these causal discovery techniques. Um, there's a whole space in the literature for these. Uh, 
I walked through a very simple example of the PC algorithm, but this is like a, a space that's under active research and there's new papers being published constantly on this causal discovery. Everything kind of falls into these two buckets though, the score base and the constraint base. Um, and a lot, there's a lot of work now about how to imbue these methods with this domain knowledge. So I mentioned more earlier about age, you know, being at the top of the graph, is there a way to provide kind of this hierarchical information to reduce the search space? Um, so yeah, that is a brief overview of like how to find the DAG. Let's see how to make decisions. Um, there's no questions in the chat and I'm sensitive of time because I know we started five or 10 minutes uh, after, so I will just move through. So yeah, so we have the graph, how do we make decisions? So I mentioned before, um, there's lots of methods and that the economist who won the Nobel Prize used this instrumental variable approach, but this is also an active area of research. There's all these different methods for estimating your treatment effect, um, but they all fall under this umbrella of do calculus. Uh, and essentially saying like, how do we measure the effect of doing this intervention? Um, so if we go back to the vaccine case, what we actually used was a technique called backdoor adjustment. So age is essentially a backdoor path between the vaccine and severe cases. Um, you can ignore like the direction when looking at these paths, you're just looking to see if there's a path. And this is essentially exactly what we did before. We were marginalizing out the age to get what's the effect of having a severe case given that you had a vaccine. And this is the same yeah, graph that we had earlier. Uh, there's a lot more sophisticated methods to do these adjustments as well. Um, I'm sorry, this slide is a bit blurry. The issue is, uh, this was from an invited talk at NeurIPS in 2020, but like you don't have access to the full slides. I don't, I wasn't gonna walk through the math, but essentially there's a lot of work trying to figure out what makes a valid adjustment set. Um, so knowing what you need to essentially adjust for in this case to uh, get a good estimate of your interventional distribution. Um, so just like quickly on a broad case, like can we always figure out what this treatment effect is? And yes, you can. Um, you can provide a DAG to this method developed by Spitzer and Pearl, and it will tell you if uh, you have the sufficient paths to perform like you know these specific adjustment set calculations. Um, and if you do, you're able to estimate this interventional distribution. So again, this isn't building a model. This is just looking at the graph structure. So you're already able to estimate what the effects of these interventions are without building a, a formal model. Um, and as I mentioned, yeah, this is quite an active area of research. Here's some publicly available um, libraries from some quite big names, obviously. Uh, so you can you know, look at their GitHub. You can rely on these packages. These are all uh, Python. This one's R, but these ones are Python. And you can uh, you know, try this backdoor criteria. You can do instrumental variable approaches. Uh, so please take a look. Um, but I think the more interesting idea is now that we've had a graph, let's build what's called a structural causal model and let's see what that can actually do. Um, so a structural causal model is a directed acyclic graph plus some functions on the edges. So um, please forgive the notation here. I'll use a different notation for the noise, but essentially for every node in the graph, it is a function of its parents and some noise. Normally you make an additive noise assumption and a lot of models will even just assume that this is a linear function. So it's some linear combination of your parents plus some, some noise term. Uh, so kind of in the COVID case, you know, we just have a very simple decision tree here as an example. Um, but yeah, here's where I mentioned the notation changes a little bit. Normally you have like these exogenous variables which are the noise your endogenous variables, which is what you've observed, and the functional dependencies on each edge. So this is just a very simple linear model here um, that gives an example of an SCM. Um, so this obviously is a lot more informative than just the DAG alone. 
And what you can do is quite powerful with these structural causal models. Um, what it gives you is it has an underlying DAG. It has learned to estimate the observational distribution. In traditional ML, that's really all your modeling is this observational distribution, um, which again are normally just like conditional mean estimators when performing empirical risk minimization to supervise learning. Um, but the structural causal model allows us to estimate the intervention distributions and perform counterfactuals. Um, so there's like Pearl's causal hierarchy, also known as like the ladder of causation. And it's saying like to do these things, you need models that support each level. Essentially, this is what it says. If you only have an L1 model, which is really just a traditional ML model, you can only make, you know, estimates on associations between variables. You cannot estimate what the intervention will be if you act on specific features and you can't look at the counterfactual scenarios. Um, and Berenbaum and his co-authors have kind of a corollary proof showing that this is impossible. So what you really want to like take a principled approach of doing interventions and counterfactuals is having this structural causal model. Um, and you can train them like with you know, normal approaches like SGD and stuff to learn these functions. Um, I'm quite sensitive on time, so I'm trying to just get through just because we started a bit later, but. Um, it's, it's, it's okay, Andrew. So we, we've got some flexibility. So, okay, yeah. cool. I just, yeah, I wanted to make sure I left time, but yeah, I don't have uh, too much more. Um, so yeah, so we have an SCM. How do we now actually, you know, do this estimate for, the uh, interventional distribution. And what to do an intervention, you actually cut the edge at anything going into the node that you're intervening. You set the variable to what you want and propagate it through the graph. So in this case, we now want to force. So we have some patient um, and we want to force what would happen if they got the vaccine and estimate it. We have learned the functional dependencies along these edges. We're intervening here, we break this edge. We say true, and we propagate it through the graph and measure what's the, 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 you know, the likelihood that they would get a severe case if we did that. Um, so this is specifically doing an intervention. I'll walk through kind of a cooler example for counterfactuals in a second. But one other thing to point out is like an SCM doesn't lose any predictive power. You can also do these predictions um, either on the observational or interventional distributions, and we found that they actually generalize much better than deep learning approaches um, because you're essentially modeling the true data generating process. Uh, you're going to generalize better out of sample. Like deep neural nets, highly parameterized models are going to overfit to your training data, and they might have better in sample performance. But as soon as you get out of sample, um, we found these causal models end up uh, generalizing better. So We'll see like these deep neural networks have like crazy low in sample error, but then much higher out of sample where the SCMs are quite flat in and out, in and out of sample. So, you know, that's obviously good as well. Um, just to mention also, yeah, hierarchy of models. Uh, so statistical is really just looking at the observational. This is what a lot of ML is doing now. The causal graphical is kind of what I mentioned before, estimating these treatment effects just based off of the graph without learning a full model. What I'm talking about now is the structural causal model. Um, so you can predict, you can do interventions, counterfactuals, and like there's still a question mark of whether or not you can learn it from data, but I would say causal lens and the wider research community is working a lot to try to figure this out. Ideally, we're we're using observational linked data in some human context to try to learn these structural causal models. And a mechanistic physical is kind of maybe like what's built in the other sciences a bit more. You might have like physicists build these like complex uh, PDE for some dynamical system that they're studying. That's kind of what is meant by a mechanistic uh, physical model. So this is a nice like visual as well from a um, paper from Shulkoff and his co-authors showing what a statistical model is really just estimating this observational distribution, whereas you're able to estimate observational and all of these interventional distributions with a structural causal model. 
So I mentioned, yeah, I was going to talk about how to do a counterfactual. Um, so counterfactual is specifically at like for, for a specific observation, right? This one person or this one data point, you want to know what would happen if something different happened. Not, it's not like a global level counterfactual. What would happen if I increased my marketing budget? It's what would happen if I sent this customer two more emails? Would they have renewed? Um, so these three steps for you. Uh, calculating the counterfactual using an SCM, I'll walk through in this case of algorithmic recourse, which I think is quite a cool paper. Um, it's somewhat new. And I think it's going to be very important from a lot of regulation that's coming up. So both the UK and EU are introducing regulation where consumers are entitled to know why an AI algorithm made a specific decision. So imagine you got rejected for some mortgage. And they said, well, this black box told me no. Like you have no insight into why it happened and you don't know what corrective action to take. So this like formulation of algorithmic recourse is really defining the cheapest action to take to get you over that decision boundary. Um, you, there's many ways obviously to get approved for the mortgage, but you don't wanna take a very expensive path, right? You wanna take the like shortest distance to get over. Um, and I think, you know, as regulations get introduced by governments, if you can't give them that answer, you can't deploy your model in the real world, right? So like uh, big corporations are really gonna have to change some of like their modeling decisions and how they, they do things internally to, um, to support this. Uh, so I'll walk through it very quickly, right? The, the goal is to find the optimal action that minimizes some cost um, of all possible actions and your like factual points. So this would be what your income is, what your savings is, stuff like that, such that uh, H here could be some black box model, right? This is a, the bank's decision where if you pass in your structural con or factual, you get a different response than the factual. So think of this as, as a binary classifier. Uh, when you pass in your new feature vector, you'll get approved when before it was false. And this is specifically doing that abduction action step. I'll walk through that in a second. Uh, and you can even put like plausibility and feasibility constraints on these actions. So feasible meaning like you can't enter, like your age cannot decrease, right? You can't tell someone, oh, be two years younger, you'll get approved because banks might not approve people for mortgages, 30 year mortgages if they're 40, right? You'd, you'd be in your retirement age by the time the loans close. So you can't tell someone to go back in age. Uh, you also can't tell people to, to directly intervene on their credit score, for example. Um, so that's kind of like ways to encode this feasibility. So here's like a you know very simple example of uh, four feature variables and like your target Y in this case. Uh, so this is the notation I was using before for the exogenous variables. And the abduction step is essentially just like working backwards up to, to recover what the value of these exogenous variables are. Um, so these just are set directly for X2 and X1. So you wanna get what the exogenous variables were for your factual uh, and you're essentially just, you know, removing the contribution from the function along the SCM. Uh, then you now wanna do your action. So you've recovered all of the exogenous variables. You wanna choose what feature to interact on. Um, in this case, they just say it's like some delta from the factual. And for cost, they normally just use some like L1 norm, meaning like the absolute distance between your factual is a cost, but there's no reason you can't have non-uniform costs. Uh, increasing like your salary might be a bit easier than saving twice as much per month, for example. Um, so you can encode all of that into the problem. And now you're, you're calculating uh, what is like, if you take an action on something, as I mentioned before, the intervention you break the edges above and you just set something directly. So that's what you're doing here. If you intervene on this variable, just set it to the new value. Otherwise, um, set it to what it is from the SCM. And once you've done this action, now you propagate it through. So if I didn't intervene on X3, but I did intervene on X2, obviously that new value of X2 has to flow down the graph, right? So it's gonna get updated based off of this F3. Uh, so it essentially flows back through. Um, so it's fairly like very easy, right? You, you take what you've observed, this X factual, you step, you like 
invert the graph. You kind of do the invert version of the functions to recover your exogenous. You determine where you want to act, and then you propagate it through. Um, and this is quite important. So this is a simpler way to do it, the abduction. You're actually just taking the difference between uh, the parents of the structural counterfactual and your factual if you do not intervene. If you do intervene, you just set the value directly. Um, but this is quite important that you really need to flow like through. The features are all interacting, right? You can't assume that your features are independent. And the example they give from the paper is essentially um, income and savings. Say someone saves like 10% each month. If your income increases, you're gonna save a little bit more each month because of that downstream effect. Whereas other cases, if they just assume independence between all the features, you're gonna tell someone to do some other action that's actually more expensive than the simplest one. Um, and that's kind of what they show in the paper. Um, so this is something we've had like quite a lot of success for actually. Um, we use it in our platform. We have like a more detailed tech report on it. Uh, so yeah, a bit of a shameless plug there. Um, so I know we're right at the end of time. So I just wanted to show one last thing. Essentially, uh, there's a bit of a argument for why these models are inherently explainable. Um, the conclusion I just wanted to say, like if people are motivated by this area, I kind of gave a very high level touching on like a recent advancement with the recourse and then some more traditional approaches with the PC algorithm, backdoor adjustment. These are a bit more well-known techniques, but like this is an area that's ripe for research. There's been like an exponential increase in papers at NeurIPS for causal papers. Um, there was quite a big workshop the last two years. I think there was the Y21 this year that was quite big. Uh, I showed some of the libraries that are available by some big names and I'll capture those on the next slide as well. Um, so it's becoming more and more popular. So people found these things interesting. Um, there's a lot deeper rabbit hole to go. And there's quite a lot of like po popular open source packages and repositories. Um, some of the logos I had there before, right? CMU, Huawei, Google, IBM, Microsoft. Uh, and they have a lot of stuff implemented. So a lot of these more complex causal discovery methods, a lot of these causal inference, meaning like how to estimate these treatment effects, um, lots of libraries out there to do this. So you can kind of get your hands dirty and play around with it. Um, yeah, and I finally provided like some further reading. I can share these links after. Some of them are like quite good uh, intro tutorials and blogs, and then some are more detailed textbooks. This Elements of Causal Inference is quite a good book, but it's maybe like jumping in on the, the deep end. So I tried to find a nice mix here. Um, so yeah, to conclude, to make like actual decisions in the real world that people can trust and that like big corporations will, will actually use, we need to be able to consider scenarios. We need to like accurately estimate these what if scenarios. Conventional ML really fails here because they're building these predictive models just based off spurious correlations. They're not accounting for these confounding effects. These black box models are not explainable. Uh, there's no trust. If, as regulation gets added, they're not gonna be able to be used um, we think the approach to like address all of these is to, to learn these causal directed acyclic graphs and train these structural causal models. Um, and this is probably like an initial step towards like a more general AI, right? Like it's a necessary condition to figure out this problem to be able to, to you know, make huge leaps in the future. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're working on. I kind of gave a brief overview of a bunch of different topics and causality and causal AI. Um, just to mention again, we are hiring. So if you're interested, we have a lot of different technical roles. Please reach out. And yeah, thank you again for your time today. And thank you, Andrew. Uh, there is one question in the chat. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, Mr. Shaw, you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Yes, the, under the question, thank you very much for the lecture. It was fantastic. I just uh, wanted to double check that instead of using a D, uh, DAG methodology and uh, identifying each and every variable, can we, how about using a kind of multi, uh, sort of, you know, multi collinearity, solving that type of problem in order to identify uh, 
and solve the problem very quickly. Um, uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, just, just yeah, yeah, just your opinion on that, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, you kind of can. So uh, let me, this might take a second to go through, but um, essentially you really need to look at like this asymmetry between the residuals and the variables, right? So like everything could yeah, yeah. be like collinear model. Um, and that's kind of how like, uh, so essentially this, right? You, mm. You're looking at, um, this isn't, this is piecewise linear, but you know what I mean? Um, you, you need to kind of look at the uh, distribution of your residuals to figure it out. So a lot of the score-based methods are, are really just linear models. You're learning a linear yeah. model at the same time as learning this DAG structure. Um, so like uh, the LinGam is essentially assuming nonlinear noise and it uses an ICA approach to try to learn these relationships. Um, so you definitely can, but like you have to have this like asymmetry in the problem to be able yes. to resolve anything. Yes, uh, yes, okay. Because this question was wearing a little bit of sort of econometric type hat because I used a model like Sarima and uh, Arimax, et cetera, to use mm -hmm. on so identifying, potentially solving the same problem and predicting in inflation rates or interest rates, et cetera, where uh, many economic variables are interdependent. Yeah. And instead of going in a very graph-based model, identifying interdependency between variables, mm -hmm. I found those models quite useful. Um, yeah, so there's quite a bit of work too. So um, I didn't capture time series at all here. It's mainly like IID, no, I, but yeah, you yeah. can actually like, um, if you have like X at time T, you can have X at time T minus one. And then you could have like some cycles, but you're always moving forward in time. Yeah. Um, there's this one method called like PCMCI, which uses the PC uh, as a first step to learn it for um, time series. But what we've also found, sorry, I'm just flying through the slides, um, is you can do these like vector autoregressive approaches. Right. So you first yes. train a vector autoregressive model That's up correct. until yeah. your like time at yeah. your current time. Then yeah. use the residuals of those models to try to figure out how this yeah, stuff uh, works. That's, so that's right. yeah, that's there's right. um yeah there's a vector autoregressive version of no tiers. So no tiers is another score based method that just it's mm -hmm. a gradient based method that essentially just has an acyclically acyclicity constraint yes. on yep. the adjacency matrix. Uh, you can there's no reason you can't use some yeah vector autoregressive model before and just look at the residuals and then apply no tiers. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, LinGam actually as well. And yeah. yeah, that seems to work. We've noticed we have one paper actually on no tiers where it's very sensitive on the units of the variables. So if you just rescale different columns, yeah, it puts the direction where in like the highest variance or lowest. Don't quote me. I can't remember what the conclusion yeah. was. But essentially, if you rescaled something, you would find a totally different graph, whereas like LinGam doesn't have that problem. So for like, yeah, your type of problem, I would like recommend doing some yeah, var lingam extension. I think you could even sure. find that online quite quite quickly, but yeah, that technique works well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see a hand raised as yeah. well. Hi. Yeah, I mean, first, thank you for uh, the talk and you. Uh, I think with an excellent overview. Um, I, I, I do have a question. So, um, Right, so many of these methods, they rely on uh, trying to infer uh, these uh, causal structure, the causal mm -hmm. graph. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering, so in, in situations where one infers uh, a, a graph that is slightly different from the ground truth, right? Yep. Because it's, it's data-driven. Yep. Uh, do we have any idea on how much that would impair on predictive performance? I mean, is there a way of quantifying these? It's a kind of generalization question, right? Yep. And whether in the presence of some that those kinds of mismatches, mm -hmm. uh, deep learning uh, approaches would outperform causal uh, approaches. Yeah, I think that that's actually a big gap in the literature. There hasn't been much of this sensitivity analysis. Um, it's because I would say like a lot of the direction might come from like social economic use cases as well where these graphs are kind of like built a priori. You have some domain expert 
who like builds it and just assumes that it's the ground truth. And then the other case, as you mentioned, just taking purely observational data, doing a purely data-driven approach, you're not likely gonna converge on the true DAG, right? Um, and I don't, I haven't seen much there on this sensitivity analysis saying, okay, what happens if where uh, like a certain distance from the true DAG, how poor is the performance? I would think, you know, obviously if you're quite far, it's gonna be worse than some deep neural network, but most of the techniques as I kind of mentioned, don't converge on a single graph anyways, you get like this class of equivalent graphs. Um, so you could try multiple of them. Um, there's no reason you couldn't use some like cross-validation approach to you know, build models of each of them, see how it predicts in the validation period and, and improve. Um, there's a lot of work on saying, okay, we can resolve the graph up into X percent, but we need to capture more data to resolve it further. So there's like all this like uh, experimentation design work where it says intervene on this variable because that's going to give us the most information to further resolve the graph. And I think I mentioned in the talk as well, there's a lot of work on kind of incorporating this domain knowledge. So the common example, again, is age has to be at the top, right? But in an economic scenario, like you could have some macro uh, economic variables, like you're not going to impact unemployment directly, right? So that needs to be on the top of your graph. And just defining one, like some topological sort of the graph, some hierarchy structure. Um, so like you're kind of putting some domain knowledge in is going to help quite a bit. Uh, I think the big problem as well is, yeah, really trying to shrink the search space. The search space is massive. So anything you can do to help it is going to improve greatly. Um, there's a lot of work as well on like what type of constraints people have. Just saying something like, I know that no edge exists here. Can you encode that into your method? Can you say, I know there's an edge, I don't know the direction. Um, so forbidden or allowed edges, stuff like that. But your general question about like, yeah, this sensitivity analysis, I, I think that's actually a big gap in the literature right now. Yeah, it's it's some form, I, I guess, of a simple complexity type of question. Was, you know, mm -hmm. how much data should we observe yeah. in order to, you know, first to begin with, of a reliable estimate of the graph, I assume, mm -hmm. yeah. and yep. thereupon a uh, reliable prediction. Okay, good. You, we had one paper as well. This isn't exactly in your question, but like there's a lot of assumptions that are made that are quite limiting, especially the sufficiency one. Like never in the real world are you going to observe every variable interacting on your system. So like th those papers are quite, you know, driven towards like these strong theoretical guarantees of completeness, making assumptions about sufficiency and a perfect oracle, but you're never in that scenario with any real world data. So we had one paper just saying like, how badly do the methods break down if we purposely invalidate their assumptions? Um, but that was more just on like where we had a, the true, you know, ground truth DAG and we're trying to see how far away the discovered one was. But I think what you're asking too is like a lot of these um, problems and systems, you don't have a ground truth DAG. And I think even asking domain experts, they might agree on different DAGs, right? Everyone's gonna have a slightly different scenario um so yeah how, how that how sensitive that is to misspecification i don't think has been answered too well um hannah chokler who's like our principal investigator she had a paper as well on like combining causal models so maybe like you know you want to take some ensembling technique right again like converging on some single ground right. truth of the day during process is probably not the best approach um if you have a class of possible graphs or like different human input produces slightly different graphs, you can ensemble these and probably improve performance as well. But yeah, I mean, it's still a bit early days and all of that. And I think is definitely a avenue for research. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your great presentation. And um, some of the students ask uh, from me if it is possible to share the slides after the talk or not. Uh, 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 because uh, it is really helpful to uh, dig into the, uh, the causal learning. Yeah, uh, I think I can. Um, I have some like extra, you know, slides in the back that I'd want to clear out. Um, maybe if I just, you know, produce a PDF, because I think people would really want the, 
a lot of the hyperlinks to the references and stuff. So uh, I can do that offline and I'll, I'll email it to you to, to share after. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I would like to uh, thanks for um, accepting uh, our invitation for this talk and uh, uh, thanks for audience uh, to participate in this talk. Thank you again very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, hopefully people found it interesting. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye.